Dr. Bruder, I'm coming to you from the United States of America. I hope your time in the Philippines is going well. With, um, with that being said, we need to talk a little bit about the physiology behind the skeletal system. And as you know, when it comes to the skeletal system, bone, although it appears rigid in nature, it is ever-changing. It's continually undergoing metabolism. We are constantly building it up and breaking it down. When it comes to the functions of bones, bone has numerous functions. Ed, what are you doing? You want to, Ed, why don't you just put this right in front of me so you get a quality recording? Like Amira, look at this. We'll just, Ed, I can even hold on. Oh, look at that. Look at all of those recorders right in front of me. Michelle, if you want to put yours up here in, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the four of them. Oh, look at that. Now I can just sit here and uh, watch myself on all of your microphone applications. Hello from Dr. Bruder. I see. With, uh, with all that being said, let us mention just some of these functions of bone. Um, we, of course, are learning all of the various markings on the bone. Because next session, when I am gone far away on my sabbatical, and all of you are here, one of those things that you're going to be talking about is the muscular system. And for every muscle, you're going to be talking about origin and insertion sites. You need to know those markings on the bone because they're going to serve as those origin and insertion sites for muscles, for skeletal muscles. When it comes to bone, it is going to be important for storing minerals, things like calcium and phosphate. Bone is going to be intimately involved with the formation of new red blood cells, the process of hemopoiesis, producing blood cells in the bone marrow in the long bones. And of course, we're also going to store energy in the yellow bone marrow. <sighs> Ryan, yes. what bone am I looking at in the illustration here? Is it a humerus or a femur? Ryan, you have narrowed it down to a 50-50 question. Ryan, is it the humerus or is it the femur? Ryan, and before you say anything, I have faith in your ability. I have faith in your ability to, one, Ryan, identify the bone, and also, Ryan, one in your ability to simply read English. <laughs> oh. You said it was the humerus? Yes. Ha ha, the hilarity. It is the humerus. Yes. So, when we're looking at the humerus, the shaft of the bone is going to be the diaphysis. On the ends of the bone, we have the epiphysis, where the bone is going to be growing, and our, where we find the growth plate, we have the metaphysis. On the ends of the epiphysis, we have our articular cartilage. And this cartilage that we have at the end of the bones is going to work as a shock absorber. It's also going to decrease the amount of friction that's produced in the various joints that are going to form um, as this bone articulates with other bones. In the middle of the diaphysis, we have our medullary cavity, our bone marrow cavity, where this process of hemopoiesis is going to be taking place. We have connective tissue as well that's going to wrap around the bone, forming that of our periosteum. This is broken into a couple different layers. We have that of the fibrous layer, where we have our dense irregular connective tissue, and then we also have the osteogenic layer, where we have our bone cells and blood vessels that are going to be nourishing this long bone. We've looked in the past at the histology of bone. During your last lab practical, one of the two slides that you had to identify for me was that of bone. And you knew it was bone when you looked at it and focused it under the microscope because you saw a lot of space between the cells, meaning we have a tremendous amount of extracellular matrix between the cells of the bone. And that matrix is going to be composed of water. It's going to be made up of collagen fibers. And in addition, there's going to be an abundance of crystallized mineral salts. And when it comes to the bone, it's going to be made up of four different types of cells. And we need to make sure you know all of those four cell types. When it comes to the 
four types of cells. We have that precursor where all the cells will be derived from, the osteoprogenitor cell. It's going to be the cell that's not yet differentiated, not committed to a, an adult line of development. It's still undifferentiated. But this osteoprogenitor cell still has the ability to divide, and it can replace itself as it transforms into that of an osteoblast. And when it comes to an osteoblast, these are the cells that are going to be laying down the extracellular matrix. They are going to be forming collagen fibers. But they differ, they differ, they're different from the osteoprogenitor cell in that these are the cells that can no longer divide. Eventually, though, these cells are going to no longer be secreting any matrix, and they are going to become that of our osteocytes. And we also have to mention our osteoclasts. These osteoclasts are simply monocyte after monocyte after monocyte after monocyte that has fused together to make this rather large osteoclast. And the osteoclasts are going to be in, uh, involved with the process of reabsorption of the bone, the breaking down of the bone. The building up of the bone is going to be the responsibility of the osteoblast, the breaking down by way of the osteoclasts. Blast build, clasts break down. In regard to the extracellular matrix of the bone, it is going to be made up of these inorganic mineral salts, which is why the bone is going to be as hard as it is. Calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate are going to make it up. But it's not going to be just these inorganic salts. We're also going to have the bone that's going to be composed of these organic fibers, these collagen fibers, giving the bone some degree of flexibility. This tensile strength of the bone is going to um, resist it being stretched or torn. And as we know, the bone is going to be calcified. It's going to be mineralized. It's going to be hardened as we take some of these crystals and we deposit them around these collagen fibers. When we remove these minerals and demineralize the bone with acid, we get this rubbery remnant of these organic collagen fibers that reside. Now bone, as we've talked about, is not completely solid. There are some openings in the bone, and there's that main space with that of our medullary canal. But when it comes to the bone itself, as you recall from us talking about it in the past, there are two main types of tissue. We have that of spongy bone and compact bone. Spongy bone, as the name implies, looks like that of a sponge, and we have a lot of space in it. Whereas compact bone is going to be much more dense. Not a lot of space there. So when we look at this dense bone, this compact bone, um, it looks pretty rigid. It looks pretty solid. And we find this, especially along that of the diaphysis along the shaft of a long bone. When it comes to compact bone, it's going to resist stress. By what? Resist the stresses from the sheer weight that you put on the bone and from movement as well. Ryan, this is now no longer 50-50 because you just know what this is going to be. What long bone is this? That's exactly what I am looking for. Nicely done, Ryan. So when it comes to our compact bone, the appearance of the compact bone is radically different from that of the spongy bone. When it comes to our compact bone, we have an arrangement of the osteon, where we have these concentric rings of this calcified matrix that are going to be orientated right around a blood vessel. So the blood vessel will be sticking out toward all of you in the room, and we have these almost like these rings of the tree these concentric rings, this lamella, around that central canal. When it comes to our osteocytes, they're going to be sitting in these spaces known as lacuna. And we need to allow communication from one osteocyte to another. So we're going to communicate by way of these small canals, the caniculi. This is what's going to connect one osteocyte to another for communication. When we look at our spongy bone, this doesn't have that osteon that we saw with the compact bone. Instead, this is this lattice-like work of these thin plates 
that are known as these trabeculae, struts, if you will, that are going to be orientated along the lines of stress. So we have a lot of space between the struts. And this is where we have our red bone marrow, where that process of hemopoiesis is going to be occurring. So we find this spongy bone in the ends of the long bones, inside our flat bones, in the ribs as well. Sometimes we are going to have the patient have a bone scan where we are going to give them a radioactive tracer and we will have an uptake of that tracer to various parts of the bone. When we look at the results of this bone scan, it's going to light up and show us various hot spots and cold spots. When it comes to the hot spots, these are the areas where we have an increased amount of metabolic activity in the bone. And there's many things that can increase the metabolic activity of the bone. It could be that we're dealing with some type of cancer of the bone. It could be some type of abnormal healing. It could even be normal growth. But this differs from cold spots where we don't have as much metabolism taking place, where bone has become decalcified, where there's been some fracture, some break in the bone, or even an infection in the bone. Anyone ever had a bone scan before that wants to share with us? Anyone? Amira, maybe? Where's Amira? Is she, uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, there you are, Amira. No? No bone scan? Well, thank you anyway. <laughs> the bone needs a vascular supply. It is vascular tissue, and it needs a nerve supply as well. When it comes to the periosteum, it's going to be supplied by our periosteal arteries. We have foramen within the bone known as nutrient foramen. And what passes through these nutrient foramen are nutrient arteries. And these nutrient arteries that are in the nutrient foramen are going to be supplying that of the diaphysis of the bone. In the metaphysis of the bone, we also have our metaphyseal and our epiphyseal arteries um, that are going to be supplying the marrow and the epiphysis, respectively. How does bone form? Or... How is it ossifying? How is it hardening? Well, as you recall from the past, when we talked about histology before, the connective tissue is going to originate from that of mesenchyme. And there's two different ways that bone can form. We can have that of intramembranous formation, where bone is going to form directly from those mesenchymal cells, or it can form from that of a cartilaginous model, from within hyaline cartilage which is known as endochondral ossification. So we need to talk about both ways that bone can ossify. Any questions, though, before we begin? Questions, questions, questions. Any questions at all? No? Well, then. When it comes to intermembranous formation, as we said, the bone is going to form from that of the mesenchyme. Our mesenchymal cells become the osteoprogenitor cells and then our osteoblasts. Those osteoblasts, as we said, are going to be the cells capable of secreting the extracellular matrix. So here where we have the center of ossification, we can see these mesenchymal cells. And Ali, if you had to guess, um, how would you describe the appearance of these mesenchymal cells to me? Star-shaped. Star I'd accept that, sure. What's going to happen is that those osteocytes are going to be depositing our mineral salts, the bone is going to calcify, we're going to form these trabeculae, and we are going to um, produce that of our periosteum, um, this spongy bone, um, by way of our mesenchyme condensing. So, from the top again, we said these mesenchymal cells differentiate the osteoprogenitor cell, they become the osteoblasts, the osteoblasts are going to be releasing the extracellular matrix, they mature to form the osteocytes. The matrix is going to calcify into the trabeculae, and it is going to be within the space that is going to hold our red bone marrow. The mesenchyme, as we can see here along the surface, is going to condense, and the superficial layers of spongy bone are going to be replaced with compact bone. So this is intramembranous bone formation, bone forming directly from the mesenchyme cells. But wait, is there another way bone can ossify? There sure is. When it comes to the other way that bone can ossify, we need to mention endochondral bone formation. With endochondral bone formation, we're going to lay down a cartilaginous model. 
and our mesenchymal cells, they form this cartilaginous model during development, and this cartilaginous model is going to grow. It's going to increase in length by our chondrocytes, and it's going to grow out to the side. It's going to increase in width by way of oppositional growth. So we have interstitial growth as we increase in length, and oppositional growth as we increase in width. Look what happens. Here is the cartilaginous precursor that we've laid down. It has increased in size. And right here in about the middle of the bone, we get this um, burst, this pH change that occurs that's going to cause the calcification and death of our chondrocytes. <coughs> in addition, we're going to form this ossification center. And this ossification center is going to be made up of where our pericardium, excuse me, that of our um, perichondrium is going to lay down that of periosteal bone. This collar, if you will, around the long bone. We're going to have nutrient arteries that still penetrate the bone to provide nutrients. And we form that of this periosteal bud that is going to, um, that's going to form as well as our osteoclasts are going to form in the center of this cartilaginous model. Our osteoblasts are going to be deposited over this matrix and it will calcify. Here within the medullary cavity, our osteoclasts are going to uh, form that cavity. So if that was one ossification center, as we're going to increase in length, we need a second ossification center as well. That's what we see here with the formation of the second ossification center. We have some blood vessels that are going to enter in through the epiphysis, that of our epiphyseal arteries, and spongy bone is going to be formed here. But we're not going to have a medullary cavity. What's going to happen is that we are going to ossify from one ossification center toward that of our other ossification center. So the secondary ossification center is going to be expanding, and look at that. Between our two centers of ossification, we have this epiphyseal plate, or what you probably commonly refer to as a growth plate. And so long as it's there, we have not yet reached our adult height. We are still growing. We're still getting taller when we see that epiphyseal plate. On the ends of the bone, we have articular cartilage. And as we said, that's going to be important when it comes to joint formation. So just how long is someone going to be growing for? Well, so long as we see that epiphyseal plate, we're going to be increasing in length. For most people, growth is going to stop somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25. Literally, there can't be any growth after this because this is when that epiphyseal plate is going to close. And after it closes, we just have this remnant left of it, that of the epiphyseal line. But when we're looking at that of this epiphyseal plate, we can see various layers, or what we call zones here, of cartilage. From our resting cartilage all the way to that which has calcified. So these cartilaginous cells are going to be produced by mitosis on that of the epiphyseal side of the plate. The cartilaginous cells are going to be obliterated, and they're going to be replaced by bone cells on that of the diaphyseal side of the plate. So when we look at these various zones that we have, what is going to anchor the growth plate to the bone is going to be this zone of resting cartilage. Our cartilaginous cells are going to be proliferating here in the zone of proliferating cartilage, and it almost has what we call a Rolux um, appearance, where it looks like a series of coins stacked upon one another. We then have our zone of hypertrophic cartilage, where the cartilage cells are still going to be in um, what resembles that of a column-shaped appearance. And finally, we have our zone of calcified cartilage, where our osteoclasts are going to be removing the matrix, and our osteoblasts are going to be producing and laying down new bone over the calcified cartilage. This is how these bones are going to be coming longer. So if that's how bones become longer, what about when the bone is going to increase in width? Well, that's going to be by oppositional growth. What happens here is we can find that of one of these vertically orientated periosteal arteries. 
it's going to be sitting here in this bony ridge. What's going to happen is that our osteoblasts are going to form a more prominent ridge, this periosteal ridge, and these periosteal ridges are going to migrate toward one another until we've completely encased that periosteal blood vessel. We're then going to produce that of these concentric lamella, these rings that are going to form this tunnel for that of the periosteal artery, giving us the appearance of our structural unit, that of this new osteon that has just formed. What's going to be affecting bone growth? Are nutrients? Are nutrients going to be affecting bone growth? They sure are. We need calcium, we need phosphorus, we need vitamin C to synthesize collagen. We talked about that in the past. When did we talk about vitamin C and collagen in the past? That's right. What did we say, Casey? And that's called what? And that was portrayed horribly in what film? That's right. I didn't see any pirates that were losing their teeth for being out sailing through the Caribbean for extended periods of time. I don't know enough about that to comment on that. Um, what else is important? Vitamin K, vitamin B12 as well. But it's going to be more than just nutrition that is going to affect bone growth. There is various hormones as well that are going to be important. We need that of HGH human growth hormone, not to be confused with Dr. Bruder's favorite, BGH. What is BGH? Bovine. Ooh, bovine growth hormone. Mmm, mmm. Beefy, thick cows. Yes, exactly. Um, we need our thyroid hormones. We need insulin as well. All of these are going to be important. Even our um, sex steroids are going to be starting to be released at puberty. Um, when it comes to your growth spurt and closing of the epiphyseal plate, this is going to be thanks to some of these sex steroids around the time of puberty. When it comes to changes and differences between the male and the female skeleton, it's going to be thanks to these sex steroids as well. Women, why do you have a wider pelvis? Because you're going to be under the influence more of estrogen than that of your male counterpart. What about problems, issues, difficulties, abnormalities with hormonal levels? One thing that could happen is when it comes to our human growth hormone, we could be secreting, producing too much of it. If that happens when you're a child, the condition is known as gigantism. If it happens when you're an adult, that is known as what? Acromegaly. If we don't have enough growth hormone or thyroid hormone during childhood, we get a relatively short stature, like that of dwarfism. So, gigantism makes us seven foot four, seven foot six. Oh, who is that? Oh, that's right. I'm sure some of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride. For those of you who haven't seen it, even if you think it might be a good movie, None of you have time to watch it now. You all need to study. So save it for your break between sessions. Oh, wait. You can't save it for the break between sessions because you need to be studying for ANP2. That's going to be starting just a week later. And all of you need to be ready for your new professor. So all of you are going to be studying the muscular system and the physiology behind muscle contraction. Don't think of it as a week off. Think of it as a week to prepare for week one. Acromegaly, as we said, is what happens in adulthood after the epiphyseal plates have already closed. Can you grow taller after the epiphyseal plates have closed? No. You can grow out to the side. Big, wide, prominent forehead. Oh, big jaw, space between the teeth. Big hands, big feet, size 22 shoes. That's acromegaly. Let me show you a picture of something. Um, next session you're going to be talking about the endocrine system. What are we looking at here? Any idea? 
Any idea what this could be? Yes, ha, huh, who's not even really in this class. What is our orientation? What are we looking at here first? We're looking at the skull. So the top of the skull has been removed, and we're looking down here into the cranial floor. So one of the things we can see is that of our Turkish saddle, the cella turcica. And what do we say usually sits in and is protected in the cella turcica? The pituitary gland. And usually the pituitary gland is about that big. You can see here the pituitary gland is going to be much increased in size. This is what we call a pituitary adenoma, or a tumor of the pituitary gland. One of the effects that a pituitary adenoma could have is that it could cause you to hypersecrete, release more growth hormone than normal. If this happens in childhood, the result could be gigantism. If it happens later in life, the result could be acromegaly. Lexi? Okay, so for acromegaly, you said they can't grow taller, they just grow bigger. Why? Because the growth plate has fused. When that fusion has occurred, we can't grow any taller. That guy was like seven foot four, so he was already seven foot four before. So we looked at someone who, when they were young, was afflicted by gigantism. Oh. Because it wasn't treated, we had issues with acromegaly. Precisely. They sure can. They sure can. Lexi wanted to set me up to show you this picture right here. Look at this individual on the left and our start date of 2001. Now, this is our baseline here. And what happened over the next couple of years, we started to see some changes in the face. Putting on some weight, more and more facial changes. This is acromegaly. What happened? Well, this patient underwent treatment, and after treatment, you can see a decline in some of the features of acromegaly. There are several different ways we could treat something like this. Of course, there's always surgery. We could always go in and remove part of the pituitary adenoma, or we could give an agent that is going to counteract the growth hormone, something known as somatostatin. So either of those could potentially be used when it comes to treating acromegaly. How well did um, this individual fare right here? Yeah. Clearly, yes. Questions on that at all? What happens all throughout life? Bones are going to be remodeled. Remember, they are not stagnant. They are undergoing a lot of metabolism. These osteoclasts are going to be carving out small tunnels, and osteoblasts are going to be building new osteons. Um, we are, our osteoclasts are going to form these leak seals around these cell edges and we're going to be releasing enzymes and acids underneath them. We're going to be releasing some of those mineralized salts into the interstitial fluid, and then the osteoblasts are going to take over and rebuild these structures. And this process occurs continually all along that of the lines of mechanical stress that are put on the bone. We can look at something like the distal femur. Every four months it is going to be completely remodeled. Oh, what happens if someone breaks or fractures a bone? How long might we typically expect them to be immobilized in a cast for? Could be as much as four months. Why? You get some idea here. That's how long it's going to take to completely turn over that tissue. Speaking of breaks, though, we should mention a few things about fractures, a break in the bone. When it comes to healing a break in the bone, 
It, of course, is going to be faster than a tear in cartilage because bone is going to be vascular where the cartilage is avascular, but it still takes a tremendous amount of time for repairs to occur in the bone. There's a couple different ways that a fracture could be treated. We could have the patient undergo a closed reduction where we simply manually put those pieces back in place and then cast it up. Sometimes though we need an open reduction where we're going to open up the extremity put in the plates, the pins, the screws, in order to maintain alignment. When it, Hillary? Is it true at Balsam that when you have bone breaks and it comes in together, it actually gets like stronger than that? No, at the side of the fracture, it's, uh, it's usually very strong. And we, we could actually say at some times that some of those fracture sites that might even be more strong than before the fracture occurred. No. Now, there's many different ways that we can um, name a fracture. It could be based upon its shape. It could be based upon its position um, as well. We can look at those fractures that are closed fractures, meaning they're not going to involve the skin. No bone is going to be protruding through the skin. Whereas here you can see when it comes to an open fracture, one end of that break is going to be protruding through the skin. That is an open fracture. Sometimes the broken ends of the bone are going to be fragmented into several pieces. That's a comminuted fracture. Sometimes we're not going to break all the way through the bone. It's just going to be a green stick fracture or a partial fracture. What's a green stick? Casey? I'm just thinking of like a green stick in nature. Like a twig that we just cut off a tree that's still, uh, that's still alive. So it's not like a dead branch that's going to snap, but this is going to have much more of a degree of pliability to it. No, it, can, it could conceivably happen in anyone. More often than not, those who are younger are going to be more prone to developing green stick fractures. Sometimes you can drive part of the bone into itself. And we're going to have a shortening of a long bone. That's an impacted fracture. There's some fractures that are um, that are, we see so often that are going to be named when uh, a part of the bone is going to be fractured, like the distal portion of the fibula is a Potts fracture, and the distal portion of the radius is going to be a Collie's fracture. Lexi? Can you explain the Sure. Um, let's say, for example, um, Ryan and Dr. Bruder we're sparring for our upcoming MMA match. Um, Dr. Bruder, being as quick as he is, ducked before Ryan attempted to land a punch on Dr. Bruder. Because Dr. Bruder ducked, and we were training in a cinder block training facility that was reinforced with rebar, when Ryan missed Dr. Bruder, because of Dr. Bruder's incredible dexterity, Ryan struck the reinforced wall with his fist at full strength. Some of those bones almost disintegrated as they became impacted into itself. Some of those metacarpals lost length as they were driven into themselves and into the carpal bones. Ryan was so strong that his radius and ulna were driven into themselves. His humerus literally shortened as it was driven into itself. Dr. Bruder then quickly got the pin. Oh wait, it was only an exhibit. They were only training, so it didn't it didn't matter. But just for the sake of um, just for the sake of victory, Dr. Bruder still pinned him nonetheless. How do you treat that? How do you treat that? First off, you tell no one that they should ever compete in MMA because it's far too dangerous. And secondly, it is going to, uh, it is going to require that of um, probably a few pins and some rods in the bone. You're, not, you're never going to go back to its original length, but we, it, it might increase some. So, how, how, how are we going to remember that a Potts fracture is a fibular fracture, and a Collie's fracture is a radial fracture. 
I always remember I kick the pot and I put the dog treat in my hand to feed the collie. The collie. The border collie. The, the collie's fracture. I kick the pot and I feed the collie the dog treat from my hand. But I'm sure some of you can come up with better mnemonic devices than me. Some of you, unlike Dr. Bruder, may decide to exercise at some point in your lives. And when you exercise, you can get things like shin splints as you run, some of these stress fractures in your bones, some of these small microscopic fissures that occur when it comes to repetitive, strenuous activity. Pounding that pavement day in and day out, or prepping for whatever bodybuilding competition you partake in. Who does something every single day to train? Same thing over and over. Oh, Amir. Well, she's not here. Okay, so we can all say things about Amir since she's not here. Who wants to? Uh, moving on. <laughs> moving, uh, moving on. We need to mention what happens when it comes to repairing a fracture. Well, the first thing that happens when a fracture occurs is that we get a hematoma. So there's an intimate relationship between that of vessels and the bone. And when we fracture the bone, we're going to tear vessels as well. So we're going to get a clot a little bit after the fracture has occurred, and some of the bone cells are going to die. We're going to get inflammation at the fracture site. We're going to bring in some phagocytic cells that are going to come in and clean up um, some of the cellular debris, potentially any microscopic invaders that have come in as well. We're going to have some angiogenesis that is occurring as we lay down new capillaries in the damaged area. And then we're going to form that of this fibrocartilaginous callus that forms. And what's going to happen is that our fibroblasts are going to um, lay down some collagen fibers and our chondroblasts are going to be producing fibrocartilage in order to span the areas of the break. Questions at all? We produce this bony callus um, between the side of each of the fracture sites and we're going to have this for a few months. But as we said, bone is going to continually be remodeled and this compact bone is going to be replaced by spongy bone in the callus. But it takes a little while, as we said, to resurface the bone. And eventually, as the bone is remodeled, it's going to basically resemble the normal shape of the bone before the fracture occurred. We need to mention a couple words about calcium homeostasis as well. When it comes to the bone, it is a great reservoir of both calcium and phosphate. And next session, you are going to come back to calcium time and time again here. Whoever you're with next session, one of the first things you're going to talk about is muscle contraction. And the two things that you need for muscle contraction, besides ATP, it's also going to be calcium. So long as you have calcium and ATP, you're probably going to be able to have a muscle contraction. So we need calcium for both muscles and nervous functioning. We need it for blood clotting. And we need it as an enzyme in many different reactions. Now, as I told you before, I don't want you to spend much time ever memorizing lab values and parameters for me. Why not? They vary from institution to institution what's considered normal. But one thing I want you to know, ballpark, is going to be your calcium levels. When it comes to calcium in the plasma, it's going to be between 9 and 11. Now, I don't care how you remember, but I'm hoping that there's some way you can remember 9, 11. Um, however you can remember 9, 11, so be it. But between 9 and 11 milligrams for every 100 milliliters of blood is going to be our normal calcium levels. Ed, how do you remember 9-11? Any idea? Okay, good. I'm glad it is easy. Um, what happens, though, if levels are too high, if we go much above 11? Well, there's the potential for cardiac risk. What happens when we're much below 9? Well, there's the potential for respiratory arrest. So we want to maintain that homeostasis and maintain those calcium levels of ballpark around 
9 to 11 milligrams for every 100 milliliters of blood. Look at this. Everything is going to come back full circle, Michelle. Michelle, we talked about feedback loops in here back in week one. Michelle, is this positive feedback or is this negative feedback? Are you positive it's positive? Why would you say it's positive? Are you just guessing? What's that? Your gut. I am sorry that your gut sold you short. Do we see any way that we can fall out of this loop? No! And as we recall, in most instances in the body, homeostasis is going to be maintained by what type of feedback loops? Negative. Calcium regulation is a classic example of negative feedback. So, in a situation like this, some stress caused a disruption in homeostasis. What's going to happen? Well, our blood calcium levels are going to decline. We need some receptor that's going to detect those calcium levels. And in our parathyroid gland, we have cells that can detect those low calcium levels. We're going to send a signal from that of those parathyroid gland cells to that of our parathyroid gene to turn on and rev up production of parathyroid hormone. Because that parathyroid hormone is sending the signal to that of our effectors, our osteoclast and the kidneys, to do what they can to increase our calcium levels. And how are these effectors going to increase calcium levels? Well, that parathyroid hormone is going to cause our osteoclasts to increase bone reabsorption. If we increase bone reabsorption, we are going to break down more of the bone so more calcium will be available in circulation. In addition, our kidneys are going to retain calcium. So if we're retaining calcium, we're not urinating it away. So more of it is going to be available in circulation, and those circulating levels of calcium will increase. In order to control calcium, we need to make sure we understand the influence of two hormones. Parathyroid hormone, as we just mentioned, in order to increase our calcium levels, as well as calcitonin, from the thyroid gland to regulate calcium levels if calcium levels are too high. If levels are too high, we need to inhibit the activity of our osteoclasts, and we need to increase our bone formation by our osteoblasts, taking more of that calcium and depositing it into the extracellular matrix. This illustration here is of exactly the same thing. What happens when calcium levels are too high? Calcitonin is going to be released, causing a breakdown of our bone matrix to decrease and our calcium levels to decrease. When calcium levels are low, parathyroid hormone level is going to increase, causing a breakdown of our bone matrix to increase and our calcium levels to increase. So we need to know this relationship between the thyroid and the parathyroid, between calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. We'll come back to this as well next session when you talk about the endocrine system. Questions at all on this? Questions? Kate, how are we doing with this? Any, idea, any questions, Kate? Let's mention a few things about exercise. What type of forces are going to be pulling on our bone? One thing, of course, is going to be gravity. Oh... Besides gravity, we have many mechanical stresses on the bone as well. And we're going to be laying down, we're going to be depositing mineral salts and collagen along some of these lines of stress on the bone. Unfortunately for Ryan, after he injured his arm, he needed to have a cast. He put that cast on for an extended period of time. Oh for 12 to 16 weeks. What happened? Well, his, um, the amount of mechanical stress we're putting on the bone is going to decrease and the bone density will be diminished. Ooh, you know what though, it was so bad and Ryan is in so much pain that he's not even going to get out of bed for four months. 
It could, but you're not going to space yet. <laughs> We've skipped space because, Ryan, what am I alluding to? You are now laying down for four months, and I'm going to be concerned about the development of what in you because no one's flipping you over. <laughs> oh, decubitus ulcers that we talked about. Yes. He's just sitting there watching TV all day. Yes. Now, Ryan, as you may or may not know, after he heals up, does have aspirations uh, to become the first nurse at the International Space Station. Um, as he blasts off in his uh, Soyuz capsule to the uh, space station, the one thing he needs to remember while he's on the space station, of course, is to um, not watch his space TV or listen to his space radio or eat his astronaut ice cream. The only thing he needs to do is get on that bike and ride his, his space stationary bicycle every chance that he gets. Why? Because when you are in space, no gravity is acting on your bones. No mechanical stresses are being put on the bones due to gravity, and uh, we're going to have significant weight loss. If any of you have wondered why space travel, space travel is a mythical proposition and why it will never occur, this is one of those reasons. Not to mention, of course, cosmic radiation. This is why we will never leave our solar system ever, ever, ever. It's an impossibility. Um, no, we cannot even get that far. No. That's an impossibility as well. So, what is Ryan going to do? He is going to partake in weight-bearing exercises after he gets that cast off to build more bone mass. Whatever it is. It could be lifting weights. It could be walking on his hands and arms. Whatever he wants to do in order to build more bone mass. As we said, bone is going to come from our mesenchymal tissue. That star-shaped tissue that Allie reminded us about. When we're looking at fetal development... During the fifth week of field development, we get the precursor for our appendages, that what we call limb buds. It's not until the eighth week of uh, gestation that we actually see the upper and lower limbs. Usually about the seventh week of gestation, though, that's when endochondral ossification is going to be occurring. What can you look forward to as you get older a decline in function as good as you have it now it will never get any better the rest of your lives there's no way around this this is just the normal process of aging so bone is built up through adolescence for most of you you're trying to hold your own during your young adult years but there is nothing that you can do and gradually bone loss will increase. This demineralization occurs as bone loses minerals. It's pretty rapid in women around menopause. In males, though, it is going to um, be a little later in life. Besides the demineralization in the bone, we're also going to be producing less protein. We're going to be under the influence of less growth hormone. We're going to produce less collagen. Bone is going to become more brittle and much more susceptible to fracture. Who am I concerned about in this room or listening to this video? Of course, if you are female, I'm concerned about you. Especially if you're a Caucasian female or maybe even an Asian female, I would potentially uh, be concerned. Even if you are a thin Asian female, hopefully you are lifting weights. If you're doing that, that's probably one of the best things you can do to combat what condition we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes. Of course, osteoporosis. So, when it comes to osteoporosis, the key part of osteoporosis is that of the pore, the hole, the opening, the fenestration, the window in the bone. The bone is becoming more porous, so it's becoming much more brittle. Who is at risk? Those of you who are white, who are female, who are thin, who are menopausal, who like to light up, 
who like to throw the bottle back, and who have a family history of osteoporosis. If your mother had it, if your grandmother had it, if your sisters have it, if your aunts have it, it puts you more at risk. Some of you may have heard of the fat, the fat, the fat, F-A-T, female athlete triad. This is young girls who partake in a sport that usually has something like subjective scoring. What type of events have subjective scoring? Gymnastics. What else? Ice skating. Yes, good. What else? Platform diving. Synchronized swimming. I had a student this morning who told me, basketball. <laughs> wow. It looks like you can shoot a free throw. Let's give you five points. Uh, so, this female athlete triad is going to unfortunately involve young women, 16, 17, 18, 19 years of age, who aren't menstruating because they have such a decrease in their body fat and a decrease in estrogen levels. We have abnormal eating patterns and we have osteoporosis. We're running across the floor, we hit the vault, we land, we fracture both of our femurs. Now our gymnastics career at age 16 has come to a permanent conclusion. So, in addition, individuals who are at risk of osteoporosis are those who are allergic to milk or who are not drinking milk or simply have a low calcium intake. What can we do to combat the risks of osteoporosis? Make sure we have an adequate diet. Make sure we partake in weight-bearing exercises for life. Make sure if we are menopausal and ERT, estrogen replacement therapy, is appropriate, that we partake in this. But probably the single most important factor we can do to combat osteoporosis is make sure, of course, we make those right choices when we're young. Up until the age of 18, hopefully the only thing we ever drank was milk. When we're a young adult, hopefully the only thing we ever drink is milk. No Coke, no water, just milk. Milk is all you need. Hillary? Uh, no. If you are drink, if you are drinking a low fat milk, it's the, one of the best things you can do to combat osteoporosis in your youth. Yes. Dr. Bruder prefers the skim milk himself. Hopefully, all of you do as well. How much higher in fat is almond milk? Not much, no. Hmm. Lower. lower than skim milk, really. And it's good in smoothies. I had one this morning. Um, uh, you know what? I will. Uh, I will look up those exact values, and we'll uh, we'll come back and talk about it in just a few minutes. Other comments? Other comments at all? Okay. One, um, one final thing I want to finish on then is the idea of rickets and osteomalacia. Rickets in children, osteomalacia in adults. When it comes to rickets, our calcium salts aren't being deposited properly, and as a result, these bones are going to be prone to deformity. We can get bowing of the legs, deforming, deformities of other bones of the body as well. If this occurs in adults, and we have failure of the bone to ossify, it is osteomalacia. And unfortunately, when it comes to adults, we are much more prone to fracture hips if we have issues with osteomalacia. Questions? Questions you have? Um, that's going to have to do with the arches of the of the foot, as opposed to the uh, the bone. Yes. Has anyone ever heard of osteogenesis imperfecta? Yeah. Oh, I. What have we heard about that? Is that like when bones are like really brittle? Brittle bones. Yes, exactly. Didn't someone portray this in film rather well back in the year two thousand? Wasn't there a movie about this? Someone with osteogenesis imperfecta. Was there a film about that? 
Discovery. Someone who was the antagonist to Bruce Willis? Anyone ever heard of Samuel Jackson? Oh, that is a classic example of someone with osteogenesis imperfecta. Yes, exactly. Yes. Very good. Well, uh, for the remainder of our time together, these final two hours, we will have time for some presentations. Amira? Good luck. Ed, study hard. Lexi, study harder. Michelle, study the hardest. Everyone else, study even more. Um, everyone else. Uh, huh, we're